So hi everyone uh, for joining us today. Uh, welcome to the fourth talk of the 2024 invited seminar series organized by IEEE Computer Society San Diego chapter. And we are delighted to host Dr. Micah Goldblum. Uh, he's a postdoctoral researcher from New York University and uh, is our uh, guest speaker today. Uh, this talk is co-hosted by IEEE Computer Society chapters of San Antonio, San Francisco, Oakland, East Bay, Pikes Peak, Hawaii, and San Fernando Valley uh, chapters, as well as the Computational Intelligence Society chapter of San Diego. Uh, Open Research Institute Incorporation is our media partner for this entire series. Uh, and uh, in the chat, I have posted uh, information about two of our upcoming talks. Feel free to take a look. I'll, we'll uh, in a few days we'll uh, share the registration link and everything. Uh, with that, I'd request uh, Dr. Piraz Khuram Shahi is the vice chair of our chapter uh, to briefly introduce our uh, guest speaker today. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Uh, hello, everyone. So today uh, we are delighted to have Dr. Michael Goldblum. Uh, he's a postdoctoral research fellow at New York University, where he works with uh, professors Jan Lacone and Andrew Gordon Wilson. Prior to his current position, he received his PhD in mathematics from the University of Maryland, where he worked with Dr. Tom Goldstein and uh, Washaya Saga. Uh, I'm sorry if I butchered that name. Uh, his research is focused on both uh, applied and fundamental problems in machine learning, including safe and reasonable AI and mathematical and computational tools for understanding and improving neural networks. His research portfolio includes award-winning work in Bayesian inference, generalization theory, algorithmic reasoning, and AI security and privacy. Micah's paper on model comparison received the Outstanding Paper Award at the ICML 2022. So with that introduction, uh, that Dr. Uh, Goldblum, the floor is yours. Well, thanks for having me and thanks for the great introduction. I'm Micah and I'm from NYU. Today we'll talk about deep learning theory, but we'll mostly do intuition and experiments and just a little bit of theory. So not too, too much math. Um, historically, theories of deep learning were built atop simplified setups. Think two-layer neural networks, deep linear models, infinite width limits. <clears throat> neural networks are very, very complicated, and therefore we make all these simplifications. But these simplifications pair away features of real deep learning systems, which just might be responsible for why they work so well in practice. So we want to build theories of deep learning that are compatible with practice, but we also want to use experiments to put theories to the test. We want to know just how much or how little theories can explain in reality. So we'll do both of those things today. But furthermore, if we can understand deep learning better, then maybe we can build new systems, maybe ones with new capabilities or ones which are more reliable. So I'll close with just a small taste of our recent work on new applications of deep learning. For the purpose of this talk, I want to focus in on generalization, which I think is the most important property, not only of neural networks, but of machine learning systems more broadly for understanding why they work so well. So let's start with an introduction to generalization. When we train a neural network, we start out with a highly flexible function class, think millions or billions of parameters. And by wiggling those parameters around, we can control exactly which function our model represents. Now, the next thing we'll do is we'll specify a loss function or a training loss. A lower value of the training loss indicates a better fit of the training data. And therefore, we will minimize the training loss, usually with some flavor of gradient descent. So we'll roll down the loss surface and hopefully we'll end up at or near a minimum. But it turns out we don't really care about the training loss for its own sake. It's a proxy for what we really care about, which is how well our model performs on new unseen or test data. And this ability to extrapolate from training data to new unseen test data 
is what we call generalization. Now, it may be possible to build all sorts of highly flexible models that can fit lots and lots of training data and yet fail to generalize to new unseen test data. But in so many cases, neural networks seem to generalize really well. So I want to understand why do neural networks generalize well, that will be the theme of the talk today. Let's do an experiment. We'll train a convolutional neural network, the ResNet, and a linear model, the support vector machine. Now, both these models have a similar number of parameters. And because they both have a lot, a lot of parameters, they both can fit a lot of image classification data. They both achieve perfect training accuracy. And yet, when we go to test the models out on new unseen test data, we see that the linear model makes more than 10 times as many errors as the convolutional neural network. So we see here that you can build all sorts of different models that can fit lots and lots of data, and yet some of them might generalize much, much better than others. I want to know why this convolutional neural network generalizes well. So that's going to be the theme of this talk. I want to know why neural networks perform or generalize so well. And let's start by exploring some properties of neural network loss functions and what they can tell us about generalization. When we train a neural network, we're optimizing a highly, highly non-convex loss function. So there might be all sorts of different minima available for us to find. And yet, for some reason, when we train our neural network, when we find a minimum, we always seem to find one that generalizes well. So why is that? Why do we always find minima that generalize well? And the most obvious explanation might be that maybe all minima have good generalization. If all of them have good generalization, it doesn't really matter how we look for them, which one we find. As long as we find one, it will generalize well. But it turns out that neural network minima can be bad and they can be bad in a couple different ways. <clears throat> so I want to talk about a couple ways that neural network minima can be bad. The first way they can be bad is they can be suboptimal local minima or minima where we just don't fit the training data nearly as well as the model is capable of. And if we can't even perform well on training data, then what hope do we have of performing well on test data that we haven't even seen before? There's a body of theory which says that maybe suboptimal local minima don't exist or they're not very suboptimal, but it turns out that on fairly realistic assumptions, we can prove that highly suboptimal local minima indeed exist. The first assumption we'll make is that our loss function is continuous, and this holds for virtually all the loss functions we use in practice. Think cross entropy loss, mean squared error. So we have our loss function. And now we'll take a neural network with ReLU activation functions. Rectified linear units are one of the most popular activation functions in practice. In fact, we just use them in the convolutional neural network experiment. Okay, so we have our neural network, and now we'll take a second model, a linear model, and equipped with the neural network and the linear model, we get the following result. If there exists a parameter vector, um, where the neural network achieves a lower value of the training loss than the linear model can achieve, then the neural network will also have highly sub, or will have suboptimal local minima. And just how suboptimal they are, called the suboptimality gap, is determined by just how much lower the neural network's loss gets than the linear model's loss. In practice, on a lot of the data sets that we care about, neural networks can fit the data much, much better than a linear model can and therefore they'll also have highly, highly suboptimal local minima. Now, there were a couple strict assumptions that we made here, notably that the neural network is a multi-layer perceptron. And while those are used in like tabular data or maybe in reinforcement learning, they're not so popular in other applications of deep learning like vision or language. So we can also extend our theory to other architectures, for example, to convolutional neural networks. But more interestingly, we can replace linear models <coughs> with shallow or skinny neural networks. And what we find is that there are all sorts of different kinds of suboptimal local minima in neural network loss functions where they behave like different kinds of less flexible models 
of their training data. Okay, so there are all sorts of suboptimal local minima, but what about the global minima? If we can fit our training data really, really well, then will the model generalize? And it turns out the answer is again going to be no. So let's do an illustration. We'll take a toy Swiss roll data set. The Swiss roll data set is nice because the data lies in 2D. So we can visualize our decision boundaries a little later. And we'll train a neural network on the Swiss roll data set. And as always, when we train a neural network, we find a minimum that generalizes well. After all, this is the phenomenon we're trying to explore today, trying to understand. But we can also devise an optimizer specifically to search for poor generalizing minima. And when we run that optimizer, we find a whole minefield of minima where we simultaneously fit our training data perfectly, but at the same time generalize really, really poorly. And yet when we trade, did someone say something? I'm getting an echo. Okay. Um, and yet when we train our neural network, we zip through the minefield, we navigate around these poor generalizing minima, and we always seem to find the good ones. So why is that? Why do we find the good generalizing minima, even though all sorts of bad ones exist? And the most popular explanation for why we find good generalizing minima is that it's something special about the implicit bias of stochastic gradient descent that drags us towards good minima and away from the bad ones. So I want to talk about a couple of our recent papers where we put this hypothesis to the test. The first thing that we'll do is we'll ablate away the stochasticity from SGD. This is the most widely put forth explanation for SGD's favorable implicit bias. So we'll train a model with SGD. It generalizes really, really well. And now we'll crank the batch size up to the full size of the training set. So now on every single iteration, we're gonna see every single training sample. So now we have fully non-stochastic full batch training. And it generalizes pretty well. In fact, almost as well as stochastic gradient descent. So maybe stochasticity might be a cherry on top, but it can explain why neural networks generalize in the first place. Moreover, there's a body of theory which says that, mostly done on stochastic convex optimization, which says that regularizers can't bridge the gap between full batch and stochastic gradient descent. And yet in our experiments, we find that a simple penalty on the norm of the gradient does exactly that. It recovers the performance of stochastic gradient descent, but without any stochasticity at all during training. So if it's not the stochasticity, then why do we find good generalizing minima? Maybe it's the gradients. All of these experiments were some variant of gradient descent. So maybe gradient descent has a good implicit bias. So let's ablate away the gradients and we'll need a non-gradient based optimizer. Now we can think of optimizers like zero with order optimizers or genetic algorithms, but as we take smaller and smaller steps, a lot of these optimizers start to look a lot like gradient descent. So maybe they also benefit from the same implicit bias as gradient descent. So instead, we'll use a really bad optimizer, and that is guess and check. And here is how guess and check works. We're going to randomly guess parameter vectors until we accidentally fit our training data, and then we're done. We're going to test the model out. <coughs> and when we run guess and check, we find that it generalizes at least as well as stochastic gradient descent. Now, a major caveat here is that because guess and check is such an appallingly bad optimizer, it's very slow, we can only run it on tiny training sets. And yet, wherever we can run it, it generalizes at least as well as stochastic gradient descent. So if it's not the stochasticity and it's not the gradients, then why do we find minima that generalize well? And to understand why, let's take a look at the good minima and the bad minima, and let's see what properties differentiate them. Before I go any further, I do want to introduce the sharp flat hypothesis, where flat minima are defined as ones that lie at the bottom of wide basins, whereas sharp minima are defined as ones 
that lie at the bottom of narrow basins. There's this one line of work which says that good minima tend to be flat. There's another line of existing work which says that flat minima tend to be good. Usually by intervening on training to increase the flatness, we can in turn improve generalization. And yet there's this paper that we might think of as a criticism of the sharp flat hypothesis. I actually don't read this paper that way. I interpret it as saying we have to be careful how we talk about sharpness and flatness, or else we can be vulnerable to reparameterization arguments whereby we can manipulate a sharpness or flatness metric without even changing the function that our model represents. Okay, so there might be a relationship between flatness and generalization, but I wanna know why that relationship exists. And more importantly, I wanna know why we find the good generalizing minima in the first place. So here's a hypothesis. Consider that flat minima have the property whereby when we wiggle the parameters around, we don't shoot up the loss function very quickly. But when we wiggle the parameters around, we in turn wiggle the decision boundaries around. And if we can wiggle the decision boundaries around a lot without unfitting our training data, then maybe flat minima correspond to wide margins decision boundaries. In contrast, sharp minima have the property whereby when we wiggle the parameters around, we shoot up the loss function quickly. And if wiggling our decision boundaries around uh, causes us to unfit our training data very quickly, then maybe sharp minima correspond to narrow margins decision boundaries. Going back to our toy Swiss roll data set, we can visualize the decision boundaries. And we see indeed that the bad generalizing minima tend to have very, very narrow margins decision boundaries. 100% of these training points are correctly classified, but many of them look misclassified because they lie on these tiny, tiny, tiny little decision regions, these little islands or these fingers snaking between training points. And in contrast, the good generalizing minima tend to have very wide margins decision boundaries. In more recent work of ours, we've shown how to explore such phenomena in higher dimensional data. Here's a complementary hypothesis. And this one is going to be useful because a little bit down the line, we'll formalize this into generalization guarantees. Imagine that we have some limited training data and just to fit whatever limited training data we have, we have to specify our parameters to very high precision. Think hundreds or thousands of decimal places. This is what it means for a minimum to be sharp. Then do we think that such parameters, which have such a small margin for error, will still fit new samplings of the training data. After all, if we have uncertainty about our data, we may also have uncertainty about our parameters. We can also visualize the loss surface at good and bad minima via random projection. And we see indeed that the good generalizing minima tend to lie at the bottom of wide basins, whereas bad generalizing minima tend to lie at the bottom of narrower ones. Okay, so there might be a relationship between flatness and margins and therefore generalization, but I want to know importantly, why do we find the good generalizing minima? And to understand why, consider that because neural networks have tons and tons of parameters, their loss surface is very, very high dimensional. Flat minima, because they're wide, they can hold more stuff than sharp minima, and therefore they have a higher volume. <coughs> And then the high dimensionality of the loss surface amplifies differences in volume. Consider that the difference in volume between a large radius set and a small radius set increases exponentially in the dimension. And therefore, in such a high dimensional loss surface, the flat minima are massive, massive targets. And therefore, they are very, very easy to find. All right, so that was all very speculative but it would be nice if we could get our hands dirty, run some experiments and see just how big these volume differences really are. So we're gonna estimate the volumes of good generalizing and bad generalizing basins. And if the good generalizing basins are much, much more voluminous, then this might explain why we find them in the first place. <clears throat> 
So we'll need something to measure the volume of. We'll specify a cutoff for the loss function. It turns out it doesn't really matter which cutoff we choose. A very wide range of them will work just fine, but we'll choose one. And then we'll estimate the volume of the stuff in the basin that lies below the cutoff. This will form a high dimensional solid. We wanna estimate the volume of that high dimensional solid and viewing the volume calculation as an integral in polar coordinates, we could derive a very simple Monte Carlo integrator to estimate the volume of this basin, even though it lies in such high dimensions. And running the Monte Carlo integrator, we see indeed that the good generalizing minima tend to have a much higher volume than the bad generalizing minima. In fact, this relationship appears to be monotonic. But importantly here, the y-axis is log scale. So there are about 80,000 orders of magnitude separating the volume of the good and bad generalizing minima. And when we're training a neural network and we're looking for a minimum, it's going to be a lot easier to find ones with 10 to the 80,000 times more volume. All right, let's wrap up a few thoughts before we move on. We wanna know why neural networks perform or generalize so well. And it's not because all of the minima are good. In fact, we saw they can be bad in a couple different ways. It's also nothing special about the implicit bias of stochastic gradient descent. In fact, we saw that even a naive optimizer like guess and check that finds things proportionally to their volume generalizes too. But instead, the reason that we find the good generalizing minima is that they are massive, massive targets in a high dimensional loss surface and therefore they're just really easy to find regardless of how we look for them. All right, so that was all very empirical, but it would be nice if we could also build formal theories to explain generalization too. So that's what we'll move on to next, generalization bounds. Classical generalization bounds relied on complexity measures like Rademacher complexity, VC dimension, but because neural networks are very, very flexible, they have high Rademacher complexity, high VC dimension. So these classical generalization bounds were vacuous for neural networks. But we just saw how having lots and lots of parameters can actually benefit neural networks. That can be a good thing. So we wanna build theories which can explain why models as flexible as neural networks can actually generalize well in practice. And to do so, we'll make use of pack bayes generalization theory. So I want to do a little introduction to pack bayes generalization bounds. They formalize Occam's razor. They tell us that simple explanations of the data will generalize. And the bound in particular I'll introduce is due to David McAllister in the late 90s. A whole slew of generalization bounds have come out since then, but they all have a similar flavor. And I think this one is easier to understand. <clears throat> We'll start with a prior, which is a probability distribution over the parameters that we specify before we see the training data. This is like our best guess for the parameters. And after we see the data, we'll fit a posterior. Posterior is a bit of a misnomer here. It need not be the Bayesian posterior. The bound will hold for any such probability distribution over the parameters. Now we have our prior, we have our posterior. And now with high probability, we can bound above the test error called the risk, and we'll bound it by two terms. The first term is the train error, known as the empirical risk. And the second term is a complexity term, and different bounds have different complexity terms, but they typically move something like the square root of the KL divergence between the posterior and the prior, divided by the number of training samples n. Combined, these two terms formalize Occam's razor. If we can simultaneously explain the data and hence have a low empirical risk, at the same time have a simple explanation of the data and hence have a low complexity, then our model will generalize well, provably. I also wanna take a quick peek at the complexity term. This complexity term will be low when the KL divergence between the posterior and the prior is small. So even if we have a very, very flexible model, imagine it has a diffuse support for the prior, as long as that KL divergence is low, as long as our posterior isn't so far off from our prior, then that complexity term will be low, our bound will be good. And this will enable us to get good generalization bounds 
for very, very flexible models like neural networks. We can also understand the whole sharp flat hypothesis through the lens of pack base. Imagine that we have a flat basin and we're gonna fit our posterior to that flat basin. Then such a posterior will have a low complexity or equivalently will be compressible. Imagine that I have two parameter vectors lying at the bottom of this basin and I wanna give you one of those parameter vectors but I don't really care which one I give you because they both achieve a low value of the loss or the empirical risk. Then by making a choice of one parameter vector over the other, by choosing to give you one instead of the other, I can encode an extra bit of information. If I give you one of them, I'll encode a zero. If I give you the other one, I'll encode a one. And in a flat basin, there are a lot, a lot of such choices of parameter vectors, and therefore we can encode a lot of bits of information. This is the idea underlying bits back coding. Usually we think of compression as minimizing the amount of information that we have to communicate, but sometimes we can recover information via exactly what we choose to communicate. We can also see how this factors in the generalization bound by writing the KL divergence as the difference between the cross entropy and the Shannon entropy. And what the Shannon entropy tells us is that all else equal, diffuse or entropic posteriors, for instance, those which are fit to flat basins will generalize well. All right, so that was pack based generalization bounds. But I think there's a feeling in the broader deep learning community that theories of deep learning, formal theories, are a bit too weak to tell us anything interesting about real neural networks. So here's what we'll do. We'll make the generalization bounds as tight as possible. And then we'll see if they can actually predict real generalization phenomena. All right, so let's make the bounds as tight as possible. And to do so, we'll need a few techniques. The first thing we'll do is we'll frame the problem of computing a good posterior, finding a good posterior in terms of compression. And what this means is that we'll put our prior mass disproportionately on compressible parameters, ones that can be stored in very few bits. <clears throat> and then achieving a good posterior will simply be a matter of finding a parameter vector that simultaneously fits our training data and also can be stored in few bits as compressible. And then we'll put our posterior mass on that parameter vector. So we need to compress our model. And one way we can do it is we can use a very small model, a shallow model, a narrow model, but we'll run into a problem here, and that is that often big models are better. So we want to benefit from big neural networks while simultaneously reducing the number of parameters. And here's how we'll do it. We'll take a big model, we'll flatten out the parameter vector, and then we'll apply a random projection into a much lower dimensional space. And instead of training the big original parameter space, we'll train in this low dimensional space. And that will enable us to reduce the number of parameters while simultaneously um, benefiting from big neural networks. Okay, so we're gonna train in this low dimensional linear subspace. And we can further train in low precision, allow each parameter to take on some small number of values or quantization levels. And this will further reduce the memory footprint of our model, compress, and now we've trained in low precision, but some of the different quantization levels might occur with different frequencies. And to the extent that that distribution is low entropy, we can further compress our checkpoint with arithmetic coding. Imagine that you've trained your neural network, you have a PyTorch checkpoint, and now you're gonna convert it into a zip file. That's essentially what we're doing here. And then finally, we can get an extra cherry on top by employing the intuition that the difference between a pre-trained model and the corresponding fine-tuned model is more compressible than the difference between a random initialization and the corresponding trained model. So just like how we can get a boost in our empirical performance with transfer learning, we can similarly get a boost in our generalization bound. <clears throat> and equipped with all these techniques, we can significantly improve over previous generalization bounds. <clears throat> 
I'll focus in on a couple numbers. On CIFAR 10, one of the most popular image classification data sets, we can drop the previous best guarantees by more than 30 percentage points. And on CIFAR 100, whereas previous bounds were vacuous, we can achieve the first non-vacuous bounds. All right, so we can get much tighter bounds, but there's still a lot of room for improvement here. This is still a big work in progress. It would be interesting if our bounds were sharp enough to predict real generalization phenomena that we care about. Let's do an example. We know intuitively and also empirically that convolutional neural networks have a strong inductive bias for data with spatial structure. Think images, audio. So let's see if our bound can predict this preference for spatial structure. We'll take an image classification data set and then we'll compute a generalization bound for the convolutional neural network and also for a multi-layer perceptron which lacks this inductive bias for spatial structure. And we see indeed that the convolutional neural network gets a better bound. But you might think that this is not because of the spatial structure in the data. Maybe our bounders prefers convolutional neural networks. Maybe they're easier to compress. Let's put this to the test. We'll destroy the spatial structure in the data by applying the same random permutation to the pixels of every single training sample. And now we'll recompute our generalization bound. And we see that the multi-layer perceptron, which lacked any inductive bias for spatial structure, its bound remains completely unchanged. And in contrast, the convolutional neural network's bound is destroyed. It goes way up. So we see here that our bound identifies that convolutional neural networks benefit from spatial structure in the data whereas multi-layer perceptrons don't. Recently, we've adapted this generalization bound framework to large language model pre-training. And whereas only a few years ago, it was exciting to have a merely non-vacuous bound on a toy data set like binary MNIST and on a tiny, tiny, tiny model, we can now achieve highly non-vacuous bounds for large language models with a billion parameters. Now we're going to talk about the marginal likelihood, and I'll relate this back to the to Pack Bayes in just a moment. The marginal likelihood is a Bayesian tool for predicting generalizations. Bayesians will maximize the marginal likelihood with respect to hyperparameters of the prior, or they'll compare between different models, trying to choose one with a high marginal likelihood in the hopes that that will generalize well. But it turns out that the that the marginal likelihood can fail to predict generalization. And I want to talk about some of our recent work on that front, which you can find at ICML, where it received the Outstanding Paper Award. The marginal likelihood looks a lot like your standard likelihood. Usually you have the probability of the data given a parameter vector, but now we've marginalized out the parameters, we've integrated them away, and we're left with just the probability of the data given the prior or the model. To compute the marginal likelihood, we'll start out with our training data, and then we'll make a bunch of random draws from the prior. Each of these draws is a likelihood model, so we can compute the probability of the training data under each of those likelihood models, under each of those draws from the prior. So we have a bunch of likelihoods, one for each draw from the prior. We're going to average them all up that's what we call the marginal likelihood. But it turns out that the marginal likelihood can be misaligned with generalization. One way that can happen is overfitting. If we compare too many different models or tune too many different prior hyperparameters, we'll end up shrinking our prior around the observed training data. And now our, our this causes underfitting because now we are not honestly representing our uncertainty. Another problem that can occur is underfitting. And to understand the underfitting problem, imagine that we have a prior centered at the origin and we're gonna tune its scale. We're gonna make it more or less diffuse. If we wanna spread our prior mass out across the high likelihood region, we're gonna to have to make our prior very diffuse. But in doing so, we're gonna end up spreading a lot of its mass across the low likelihood region too. And when we're sampling from our prior to compute the marginal likelihood, we'll disproportionately sample 
from the low likelihood region, and this will cause our marginal likelihood to be low. We're going to be averaging together a bunch of low numbers. So instead, if we're maximizing the marginal likelihood, what we'll do instead is we'll shrink the prior around some medium likelihood region to avoid spreading our mass out across the high likelihood region. <clears throat> And this will cause our mar or this will cause underfitting because now we're putting our our prior mass on parameters that just don't fit the trading data very well. Okay, so we saw overfitting, we saw underfitting. Now let's try to understand these problems more deeply, and we'll do so using Pack Bay's generalization theory. I do want to acknowledge it's been long known that there is a relationship between the marginal likelihood and information theory. Famously, David Mackay related the marginal likelihood to the minimum description length principle. And more recently, we've seen that we can drop the marginal likelihood directly into a pack based generalization bound, replacing the empirical risk and complexity terms by a single term involving the marginal likelihood. Okay, so now let's try to use pack based generalization bounds to understand the overfitting problem. We'll frame the problem in terms of model comparison. So we have k different models. We want to know which ones will generalize well. So what we'll do is we'll compute a generalization bound for each of the k different models. So now we have k different generalization bounds. Previously, we had that a single bound held with a probability of at least 1 minus delta. But now we need all k bounds to hold simultaneously. And using a simple union bound, we get that all k bounds hold simultaneously with a probability of at least 1 minus k delta. And 1 minus k delta is, of course, lower than 1 minus delta. It's worse. But we can make it as high as we want by choosing delta to be very, very small. In particular, let's choose delta to be whatever we previously chose, but now divided by k. So now we have all k bounds hold simultaneously with the same probability that one bound did before. But now we have to move the k on in to the bound. We're swapping out delta for delta over k. And whereas we previously had this log of n over delta, we now have a log of kn over delta. And pulling out the k, we see that we pay a cost of log of k. And because this sits right next to the kl divergence, we can think of this as we're paying a cost of the number of bits it takes to specify which of the k different models we choose. And while a logarithmic cost might not seem that bad, as we tune more and more prior hyperparameters, we're eventually going to lose our ability to predict generalization. So that was the overfitting problem. But recall, there was also the underfitting problem. The underfitting problem occurs because often we spread our mass out, our prior mass out, in the search for good high likelihood regions, we'll end up disproportionately spreading it across low likelihood regions, causing the marginal likelihood to be low. And one way we can remedy this problem is we can somehow let the prior contract before we measure the likelihood. And that way, even if we spread our prior mass out across all sorts of low likelihood regions, as long as we can rule them out quickly when the training data arrives, then we'll still like those those priors. And this is exactly what we advocate for in our work, namely a conditional marginal likelihood. We first condition on some portion of the training data before we measure the marginal likelihood. And we show that the conditional marginal likelihood, both in applications in deep learning and also outside of deep learning, aligns better with generalization. It predicts generalization better. And we can also understand why through the lens of pack Bayes. In the pack Bayes literature, we find that data-dependent priors, or ones which are learned on some portion of the training data, yield sharper bounds. But similarly, we can build generalization bounds directly in terms of the conditional marginal likelihood. And these serve as data-dependent prior bounds before the marginal likelihood. All right, let's summarize a few more thoughts before we move on. Neural networks have tons and tons of parameters, and so they seem really, really complicated. But it turns out that they actually admit very simple solutions, low complexity solutions. 
And this ability to admit simple or compressible solutions enables us to compute generalization bounds. In fact, these generalization bounds can predict real world generalization phenomena, like the preference of certain architectures for certain structures in the data, or to identify and resolve problems with tools we use every day, like the marginal likelihood. So maybe if we can build better and better theories of deep learning and ones which can apply to more and more state-of-the-art systems, then maybe these theories can move from being merely descriptive to being prescriptive and informing how we do deep learning in practice. All right, now I wanna talk about something a little bit different, and that is just what can we generalize to? How far can models generalize? <clears throat> and to that end, I'll talk about some of our recent work um, taking inspiration from humans and building models that can extrapolate their reasoning to more complex problems than they were trained on. We know that machines are really, really good at pattern recognition. They exceed human performance at benchmarks like ImageNet, image classification, they're great at object detection. But in contrast, even our best large language models like GPT-4 or Claude Opus pale in comparison to humans when it comes to logical reasoning. And one property in particular that humans have is we can think longer to solve harder or more complex problems. If I give my math students a really, really easy problem, say compute the derivative of f of x equals x squared, they'll solve it like that really fast. But if I give them a really long problem, a complicated problem, they may solve it eventually, but it will take them longer. So I want to build neural networks that can think longer to solve harder or more complex problems. And the first step we'll take is we'll replace feed forward models with very, very simple, naive recurrent ones. The recurrence will allow us to control exactly how much compute we devote to any particular problem instance. So here's how that will look. Feed forward models have a sequential stack of layers, each with their own parameters. And in contrast, the recurrent model implements depth-wise weight sharing. So we'll have this recurrent module. It will input some features. It will spit them back out. We'll feed them back in, spit them back out, feed them back in, and we'll keep on doing this. We can iterate the recurrent module as many times as we want. In fact, we could iterate it more for some samples than for others. For example, for more complex examples. So now let's see if such a naive recurrent neural network can extrapolate to more complex training samples um, that are complex testing samples than its training samples simply by thinking or iterating for longer. We'll need a data set to test this out on. And mazes are nice because we can make them more complex simply by making them bigger. So we'll train on small mazes and then we'll test on bigger mazes. We'll input the mazes as pictures and then the model will output a picture of the shortest path. We see that feed forward models generalize really poorly. They're bad at extrapolating to more complex mazes than they were trained on. And in contrast, the recurrent models are much better. By the time they reach the number of iterations they were trained on, namely 30, which is the same depth as the feed forward baseline, the recurrent models are already generalizing, reaching about twice the test accuracy. But importantly, as we keep on iterating, the accuracy continues to go up. We're running more iterations than the model ever saw during training. So we see that recurrence is a good inductive bias for extrapolating to more complex mazes. And moreover, the recurrence allows us to iterate or think longer to solve more complex mazes than the model was trained on. <clears throat> but what happens next is not good, and we'll call this the overthinking problem. I want to avoid overthinking. As we iterate and lo longer and longer, iterate and iterate, eventually our performance degrades until it reaches around 0% accuracy. So I want to avoid overthinking, and I want to talk about a couple observations which will help us get there. When we're solving a problem, it's often useful 
to look at the problem we're trying to solve while we're solving it. And fortunately, the feed forward and recurrent models can do exactly that. They can copy the problem instance, the information contained in the problem instance into their features on every layer or every iteration. But every time we copy, we might make mistakes. And as we copy and copy and copy, these errors could compound. And so we might just forget the problem we're trying to solve. So I want to avoid this problem. And here's how we'll do it. A very simple architectural modification that we'll call recall. And all recall is, is a skip connection directly from the problem instance into the recurrent module. So now in every iteration, we can look back at the problem we're trying to solve without worrying about forgetting it. Another problem we want to avoid is learning iteration specific behaviors. We don't want a model to encode an iteration counter into its features because then the model can say, now it's iteration five, do iteration five behaviors. Now it's iteration 10, do iteration 10 behaviors. But then when we get to more iterations than the model was trained on, it might just not remember, it might just not know what to do. We want to learn algorithms that can extrapolate to much, much more iterations, to much more complex problems. So I want to avoid learning iteration-specific behaviors. And this is how we'll do it. On every step of training, we'll do a random number of iterations. We'll detach from the computation graph. We'll do another random number of iterations. And when we compute the gradient of the loss, we'll only backpropagate to where we detach from the computation graph this will prevent us from learning iteration-specific behaviors. And going on back to our maze setup, we see that we can now avoid overthinking. We saturate to around 100% test accuracy, but you might not be that impressed by 13 by 13 mazes. They're not that much bigger than nine by nine mazes, but they're also not that big in an absolute sense. Humans can solve these mazes very quickly. So let's see just what models trained only on nine by nine mazes can generalize to. And this maze is a special size. This is an 801 by 801 maze. And the size is special, not because these are the biggest mazes our models can, can solve, but because these are the biggest mazes that we could fit onto our little academic GPUs. And the solutions to these mazes are very long. It takes a human a long time to solve these mazes. And similarly, it takes our model a long time, namely 20,000 iterations amounting to over 100,000 layers. And to my knowledge, these are some of the deepest convolutional networks ever run. We can also visualize the learned solver at work by outputting from the prediction head on every iteration and interestingly, it learns a known parallel algorithm called dead end filling, whereby we first highlight all the corridors and then work our way backwards through the maze, filling in all the dead ends until we're left with just the shortest path, the solution. Okay, so that was mazes. Now I wanna move on to a harder problem and that is chess. We'll use chess puzzles because they have known right and wrong answers, but they also have ELO ratings. When a human plays a chess puzzle, if they get it wrong, the puzzle's rating goes up. If they get it right, the puzzle's rating goes down. So the ELO rating is like a human metric for hardness. Let's scrape tons and tons of chess puzzles off the internet. We'll sort them from easy to hard in terms of ELO rating. We'll train on the easy puzzles and we'll test on the harder puzzles. Interestingly, there are big qualitative differences between the training puzzles and the testing puzzles. Humans have a really hard time spotting lateral or backwards queen moves or pawn under promotions. So these won't occur very often in the training data, but they will occur more often in the test data. And again, we see that recurrence is a great inductive bias for chess puzzle solving. And again, our two performance improvements enable us to avoid overthinking. We saturate to a nice stable accuracy. And finally, I wanna close with some thoughts about thinking.
there's been all sorts of work on a generalization across different kinds of distributional shifts, different lighting conditions, weather conditions, noise. But there's something special in our case, which is that our architecture is actually different at training time than at testing time than at training time. It's much, much deeper. And this ability to expend more compute on some problems than on others might be absolutely necessary um, for generalizing to more complex problems. Second, we don't tell the model how we want it to solve the problem. We let it learn a solution organically from problem solution pairs alone. And if we can, th this stands in contrast to a lot of other approaches, for instance, to alpha zero, which is simply a tree search algorithm that only uses the neural network to make the tree search faster. And if we can synthesize new algorithms end to end, um, then maybe we can learn better algorithms to replace the handcrafted ones we rely on every day. And finally, the ability to think longer to solve harder problems is only one of the amazing capabilities of human cognition. For instance, we can learn one solution strategy on one kind of problem, another strategy on another kind of problem, and we can combine these solution strategies to solve new problems we've never seen before. So maybe we can take inspiration from humans and all of the amazing properties of human cognition, and we can make models with those same capabilities too. Before I take any questions, I just want to thank all of my amazing collaborators who made this work possible. Only some of them were able to fit on the screen, but there are many, many more. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Gregbo. It was a very interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. So I have some questions, but before uh, I ask them, I would like to open up the floor and uh, ask our audience uh, about their questions, if there was any. Uh, there's one in the chat. So uh, I guess I can start then. Uh, so uh, one thing uh, you you talked about the volume uh, of the uh, minimal the, the local minimals in the optimization, and uh, the larger the volume, uh, the better the fit is going to be. And uh, uh, one thing that I'm interested in uh, to know. Uh, so when when you use a larger model, uh, essentially you're going to a higher dimensional space. Uh, does that translate to, uh, does it mean that the volumes that your local minimums have, especially the good ones, is going to increase so they are uh, becoming more easy to find? And that's why typically uh, having higher number of parameters tend to uh, be a better, give a better solution? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the these are not just local minima. These are global minima too. There are many, many global minima. But um, yeah, so the models with more and more parameters, very big models, it amplifies the difference in volume between the good minima and the bad minima. And so it makes it easier to find the good minima. And in fact, you can, and, and I think this explains all sorts of phenomena that we find in practice, like distillation or something, where it's like, when you train your small model, the standard way, just standard, you know, classification loss, you don't find as good solutions as you do with the big minima or the big models, even though those small models can find, you know, they have good solutions and you can find those with distillation. Um, it, it just, it makes the big models, the big models make finding good minima easier. And uh, uh, one other thing is that uh, I may miss that. So uh, for your recurrent model uh, on the last topic, uh, what is your control mechanism on how many times you uh, run that uh, recurrence, essentially? Yeah, that's a good question. So we actually just threshold on confidence, um, which is definitely not the optimal way to do it. There's been some work that's been built on top of ours um, later on. So I think DeepMind had this paper, PonderNet, 
um, that had like a learn stopping condition. And so there are all sorts of, you know, more sophisticated things that you can do, but we actually just threshold it on confidence. And uh, what, what is this confidence? So uh, it's just yourself. like the, the, the model predicts like soft max probabilities and it's, oh, it's, it's treating, it's treating predicting a maze as like segmentation, um, where it's like each pixel is like either on the, the optimal path or not. <clears throat> All right, thanks. Uh, Upal, uh, if you do have questions, I believe you're muted. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, so I have one question. So you showed uh, examples of nine by nine versus thirteen by thirteen mazes, but uh, uh, but the maze itself in thirteen by thirteen might not be as complex as a maze in nine by nine. But in in your current setup, wouldn't the network anyway take longer to solve the thirteen by thirteen? Well, it has to, right? I mean, 13 by 13 mazes have a higher computational complexity on average. Um, you're, you're correct that there are some mazes that you will solve very fast. Um, and, and like there are 13 by 13, um, but on average, those mazes are more computationally complex. And then we can scale up to 801 by 801, where when you generate one of those mazes, the probability that it is as 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 simple as low complexity as a nine by nine maze is extremely low, um, like extremely extremely low. Um, so so yes, you're 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 right. Um, there are some simple examples of each of those mazes, um, but generally, as you make the mazes bigger, on average, the complexity gets higher, and you sort of have some distributional shift there. But um, and of course, yeah, as a consequence, the model has to think longer. It has to to expend more compute. Because those um, problems are more computationally complex. Yeah, it's just because the way it solves the problem, right? Like for humans, a nine by nine straight line maze is the same complexity as a thirteen by thirteen straight line maze. We look at it and we may reach to that same solution. I, I don't think. Well, I don't think. I mean, I think that's a a corner case in general. Humans or any algorithm, on average. For bigger mazes, has to expend more compute. They are higher in, in computational complexity. Like if you run Dijkstra's algorithm or depth first search or whatever you want to do, humans as well, bigger mazes, on average, you're going to expend more compute eventually. I see. But, okay. but, but you're right, you can find Sorry. corner cases where, as you like, so for example, if I take a maze where the start and the end are adjacent pixels in the corner, there's only one, you know, where there are two ways, exactly two ways to go, then um, it doesn't matter what the size of the maze is, the, the computational complexity will be exactly the same. Um, that's, but, 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 but on average, the mazes will become more complex no matter what algorithm you use. I see. Yeah, I think there is a comment in the chat. Uh, from Astan, uh, in, in practice, is there merit to calculating the volume of the minima and updating the loss accordingly? Is that done or is that more of a theory thing? And updating the loss. So, so there are optimizers specifically to find, um, to find flatter minima. And, um, th you know, there's a long history of this and really they didn't work well until a couple of them. Which is, which are 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 you know a few years old. Um, there's sharpness aware minimization, um, which sort of tries to find a minimum such that the um, the like if you take a step away from that minimum in the sharpest direction, the loss is still low. So sort of like a a, a worst case sharpness um, minimizes the worst case sharpness. So there's that optimizer, and then there's stochastic weight averaging where you sort of like, you realize that you end up bouncing around a basin. And so that you then average those points to find the center of the basin to find like a flatter point. Um, there are those two flatness seeking optimizers and they both improve generalization. Um, but there are often, when you try to design a flatness seeking optimizer, there are often confounding variables that make it in practice, not make much of a difference. Those two are quite good. Sharpness aware minimization 
is still like get state of the art performance on some vision problems. Um, and it has like made improvements on language, not language model pre-training because it makes training slower. Um, but, um, but both those are good. There was the, there were old papers on like entropy SGD or SGD with all sorts of noise added that would try to like make the, the minimum minima flatter, but in practice, they didn't do very much, um, especially on modern neural networks. But, um, yeah, there, there is definitely work there and in, in particular, yeah, a couple optimizers that actually can work quite, quite nicely. Wonderful. Uh, is there any other question from the participants? Okay, if not, okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Marika. It was very nice uh, talk and very uh, interesting. And I think uh, we have all learned quite a bit and got some nice insight about the inner workings of uh, this uh, uh, optimization um, algorithms. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you me. for your talk. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.